Would you like to learn about hybrid cloud connectivity options? More specifically, the types of wide area networking you can use to connect your data center to the cloud? If so, this video is for you. In this video, we are going to discuss cloud wide area networking, specifically for hybrid clouds where organizations have a data center as well as they're connecting to at least one cloud. Now at this point, most organizations are hybrid multi-cloud. Uh, so almost every single cloud architect, enterprise architect will have, or even security architects will have to be dealing with this as part of their jobs. So we actually have uh, four different types of cloud wide area networking uh, options that we can choose from. And in today's video, we will talk about each of these architecturally we will discuss how each of these options work, and we will discuss the architectural trade-offs of say using one form versus the other. Now the four types of wide area networking we can use uh, to connect our data center and our users to the cloud, but in this case, we're talking about our data center to the cloud are going to be private lines, which we're gonna talk about much more soon. They're going to be traditional IPsec VPN tunnels. They're going to be a uh, software defined WAN and of course, SASE, Secure Access, Secure Edge. We'll begin by discussing the private line. So what is a private line? It is effectively a wire or something that resembles that at a logical layer between the campus or where you are, as well as the cloud. I'll let me map it out for you architecturally so you can see what we actually do here. So in a true, uh, uh, cloud interconnect environment. And this applies to say an AWS direct connection. This applies to say an Azure Express route. Realistically speaking, it's the same thing. What we have is we have our campus, which you can see is over here. And the campus will have a router. And that router will be in their building as the router that's going to be connecting them to the cloud. Now, it's not like a traditional private line where you've got a wire between your New York office and your London office, for example, between these two. It's a little bit different, but how does it work architecturally is you connect to a point of presence where both the cloud provider is as well as you can connect to. Uh, these could be called like an AWS Direct Connect Center. Other organizations would call them a point of presence. And what you're actually doing is you're buying a line between your campus and this actual point of presence. Now in that point of presence, you will have your router that's typically considered to be the customer edge router. And that is what you are connecting to for you. Unless somebody else is hosting something like this for you. Now in that same building is also going to be your cloud provider. So your cloud provider is in that same building. Now what will have to happen is you'll have to get a wire run between uh, your devices or the device that's hosting your network, as well as the cloud providers on network. And that's called a cross connect for the ability to get a wire run between those two. And your cloud providers typically get a, a letter of authorization or something that's required to you. And what they do is they backhaul at layer two, all your traffic uh, all through some trunk ports going back to the cloud providers. So this is architecturally what we're dealing with. So let's talk about what's great about this option. Well, if we buy a gigabyte of bandwidth, we are guaranteed to get one gigabyte of bandwidth. And we are guaranteed a certain level of latency because effectively we own the wire. And because of this, anytime we need a lot of throughput, anytime we need high performance, we typically end up with some form of a private line when we need guaranteed performance. We can also uh, determine how we use that link and we can prioritize important traffic over non-important traffic, which is an incredible thing from both a security perspective and a performance perspective. So we have a lot of control with this line because it's effectively a private line. What's also good with these is if we have a 10 gig link and the other 10 gig link isn't enough, we can bundle two of them together in a link aggregation group and get the speed of 20 gigs without having to think about complex uh, policies and routing policies to get even uh, distributed distribution of those loads. And of course we could load share across two different internet service providers, two different wide area network service providers. And of course we could load share with the BGP policy if that was a different way that we were trying to do this. So what's great is guaranteed performance. 
Now, the weaknesses or the architectural trade-offs with the private line is they've got some fairly high costs. Really, you have to pay for the line, and then you typically have to pay for a port fee with the provider, and often you have to pay to even use the line with the provider, so they can get fairly expensive. But guaranteed latency, which means we don't typically have jitter problems, which is variations between, say, latency, is suitable for storage replication, any kind of big applications that we're moving, low latency, anything, typically speaking. And that's where we would use it. But the weaknesses are high costs. It's also the lead times. I can't get a wire between me and, say, Google Cloud tomorrow. It may take a few weeks or even a month to get all of that said and done. So the time is an architectural trade-off here. Now, when we think about a private line in the old days, it was just a wire between two places we owned. Now, when we go back to this environment, we are now on a shared medium, usually with guaranteed performance, but that trunk port, and the only thing separating our organizations typically and other organizations is that dot one Q tag, which realistically speaking is enough for a private, like a layer two type VPN, but it's not encrypted. So typically speaking, if we're going to want to use these and we need security, maybe we want to use MagSec or for some other form of encryption to make sure that we're secure uh, end to end on this private line. And we always want to think about, uh, we don't typically, if we need, more, if we need uh, two lines for availability, we want to get them across two providers. We want to, don't want to have two lines with AT&T and then AT&T has an outage. We have it. Our two lines will say Verizon and Verizon has an outage and we lose both. We want to make sure we have one on one provider, one on another provider, and typically that they come into the building in a different, diverse path. So if a backhoe dug through the street on one side, the other path would still be there. So that's what you can think about in terms of uh, private type lines. Now let's discuss our next option. And the next option is an IPsec tunnel or an IPsec uh, VPN based over the internet. Now I'm going to show you architecturally what they are. And this approach has some significant strengths and it also has some weaknesses. So we'll discuss those as well. So here we have an organization that has a data center and they also have a cloud provider just like every other hybrid cloud. So this is your typical hybrid cloud WAN with an IPsec tunnel. Now what's going on, uh, realistically speaking, is the organization has an internet connection. Now, if they're gonna be connecting to their cloud provider, hopefully they have multiple internet connections for high availability, especially if they need to connect to the cloud, because if they lose their internet connection, there will be no connection to the cloud provider. So they're probably gonna need more than one. And what happens is the traffic goes out the internet and when it's on the internet, the internet is an insecure place. It is dropped into an IPsec tunnel. And then it is encrypted all along the way from the source and to the destination to the cloud provider. Now with IPsec encryption, we typically get three things. We first make sure that the ends are who they claim to be. So we make sure that the whatever the VPN concentrator or firewall is that's connecting from the data center is connecting to the cloud. We can make sure the message has not been changed and we can make sure people are, can't say they didn't send a message because we've got tracking numbers. So we've got non-repudiation protection with that as well. So this is an effective form, but we have some architectural trade-offs and let's discuss those. So the advantage of this is the internet is ubiquitous, which means it's easy to set up. We can do this in a matter of minutes and it's often very inexpensive. But the key to remember is there are no performance guarantees on the internet. There's no guarantee of bandwidth. There's no guarantee of latency. We can't say that we won't have variations in latency or that our traffic won't even be dropped. The cloud providers also have some significant performance limitations in the speed that you can actually get from the IPsec tunnels to them. So you may not get enough speed or performance with an IPsec tunnel to the cloud provider depending upon the organization's need. And if you need guaranteed performance, guaranteed performance, there are no guarantees over the internet. So this is not something to use for mission critical traffic because there are no guarantees on the underlying internet, unlike the private line where there are guarantees that you actually get what you actually paid for. So 
keep that in the back of your mind. Now, obviously, the organization will need more than one internet service provider, especially if they're using it as a wide area network to the cloud because their systems won't be reachable if that IPsec tunnel goes down. So they'll need to have at least two different internet service providers, and they will need to do, ideally, a good load sharing policy between them to improve the performance of whatever's going on through their systems as well as through the internet and also give them extra, extra insurance that if one system goes down, the other one will stay up. Now, because we've got some performance and congestion problems with the IPsec tunnel, but the IPsec tunnel is so convenient, it brings us into the world of something called software-defined WAN. And what is going on with software-defined WAN is we're going to be separating the control plane of what determines how the traffic gets to its destination from the routers. Let me architecturally show you what this looks like. So normally speaking, the routers along the way determine how the traffic gets to the destination. But the routers may not know that point A is congested and link B is not congested because that's not typically known by the routers. So with, with software-defined networking, what we're doing is we're separating the control plane from the control plane on the routers. So instead of the routers determining how the traffic goes from point to point, we can basically have the control plane. Now the control plane is often like a pie in the sky that's viewing it. I've always viewed it as a satellite that's looking at all the links and all the congestion and everything. And it's very application aware. So we can create the same kind of IPsec tunnel that we would with our software defined networking for a VPN, but we can better manage the traffic across the internet. And by doing so, we can get performance that's closer not the same, but closer to the thing, the type of performance you would actually get with a private line. Now that means we can have applications that, have jit that are jitter sensitivity. We can remove some of that jitter. We can remove some of that loss by choosing the best path through the internet. But it's not perfect. If the internet is ultimately congested or the internet ultimately has a problem, we're not going to do very well with this software-defined WAN going through the internet. But the point is, is we can use them as overlay tunnels for many other things. It's very, use, very, very useful. And it's application-aware, so it gives us closer to that kind of private line performance up to the limitations of the cloud provider's gateways. But the key to remember is these weaknesses are you can't, uh, applications can't, under, can't fix physics. If the internet is congested, it's congested all over. And if it's congested all over, there's nothing you can do to guarantee your performance. So the next option is actually pretty interesting. And it's SASE or Secure Access, Secure Edge. Now, if we look at all the options we really talked about so far, we talked about an IPsec VPN, and its, its strengths and its weaknesses, and the real limitations were, is generally speaking, performance. And then we talked about software-defined network, and where in many cases we can gain a lot of the performance loss from a private line through these kind of network-aware benefits and optimized routing that we're actually getting with software-defined networking. But what if we wanted to add security and other essential components to the process of connecting to the cloud provider. Now that gets us into SASE, and let me explain to you what SASE is. When we start looking at SASE, what we're doing is we're taking the capabilities of SD-WAN, but we're also adding firewalling capabilities to this environment so that everything is fired off, firewalled off as it's connecting to the cloud provider. And we're typically adding a cloud access security broker, which enables us to enforce, say, a security policy on various things inside of the cloud or various SaaS providers. So it enables us to have some data loss prevention things that were going on and optimize control and ensure encrypted messages. And it gives us a lot of uh, security that we can have, or at least enhances the security we can have on other people's systems that we may not actually be able to control. We're getting zero trust network access. So this puts us into the world of highly secure networking where everything's verified along the way. And we typically get some form of a secure gateway or a secure web gateway along the way. So this is a kind of interesting solution because it took the benefits of SD-WAN and it built upon it. 
And this is really good for remote access users coming in from all over the world. It tends to be part of a great zero trust strategy. So this is an interesting option. Now, the strengths of this are it adds a lot of security, especially for branch users going to the cloud or a software as a service provider. It really simplifies the internet breakout and how you're, how you're what you're expecting on everything along the way. It enables a uniform security posture. So there's a lot of good in this. And realistically speaking, when we get the traffic off of the internet to say a vendor backbone along the way, it's usually more reliable because there's more control over it. So lots of good things that come out of here. Now the reality is in many cases, not always, we connect to a sassy provider and then they back all their traffic back to us. That's called hairpinning of traffic. And when this occurs, it can actually add latency. And uh, we have to be careful how we actually do these. So the amount of density of point of presence is where you're actually going to be connecting to will also determine its type of performance. But uh, realistically speaking, these are great environments to do to, to with as well, these sassy type environments. So in this video, we talked about the four types of wide area networking or the four cloud networking options or cloud or cloud connectivity options you can have for a hybrid cloud environment. Now, if you'd like to be an enterprise architect or a security architect or a cloud architect or an AI architect, we run two weekly architecture webinars per week. In these webinars, we will go over the various architectural roles. We'll talk about what we do in those roles. We'll talk about the exact skills you need in those roles and how you can stand out and get hired. These free webinars are on Zoom, so you can ask any type of architect career questions you like, and uh, we would love to answer them live and free on these free webinars. You can register for one of our architectural webinars in the description of this video. Now, if you enjoyed this video, please give it a like, subscribe to our channel, hit the bell to be notified of new videos, and help tell others and spread the word about our channel. I hope to see you in another video, a free webinar, and uh, I'll see you soon. Take care.